The next two points, and really it's very hard to see that that's blue, familiar materials and meaningful. Those two points, I, I think of those as being unique to the person. Each person is familiar with different things. What's meaningful to one person isn't the same as another. So that's the part where we really have to know who we're dealing with before we can, before we can really be successful at, at doing these, um, incorporating these principles. And what I've attempted with, with choosing those four activities is they're not, it's not truly appealing to everyone. There are some people who won't touch playing cards, and there's some people that are, who, who aren't familiar with dice, and some people don't like birds. But I just tried to, to make it a generalization when I chose those four, four items for us to consider. So if you can just kind of pretend with me that we know that those are familiar and meaningful things to the people that we're, that we're talking about. And then the next, the next five principles, they're a little trickier, and that's where we need to have a little bit of practice and a little bit of um, guidance and some direction in order to be incorporating these principles often into, into activities. And what I'm going to do as we go through each of the activities that are on your tables, I'm going to tell you how I've incorporated those principles into the activity, just to give you the, some idea. So the first one we'll talk about is the reveal puzzle. It's this little one that has these foam pieces on it. And so the typically my puzzle is more like a five by seven, and this is a four by six, just so that it was more compact. So it is a little fiddlier than it than it would be in its in its regular state, but it, it kind of gives you the idea. Now the objective is for someone who is interested in jigsaw puzzles but really isn't capable of, of putting a puzzle together anymore. Taking this puzzle apart would be a, a kind of a reminiscent thing for them to do. So I would start by presenting the whole, the whole puzzle to the person and encourage them to touch one of the pieces and remove it. Or drop it to the floor. And so what happens is, like in this example here, you can see once you remove that. Thank you. Once you remove that little middle piece, you start to see that the image that underneath you start to see little hints of what the symbol is that's underneath. So I, I chose the Canadian flag, hoping that that would be a, a recognizable symbol. I could have chosen the PEI flag, but it wasn't that organized. Um, so, and again, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be prompting the person to actually put a name to it. We might start singing O Canada as a hint, or we might say, oh, does that look like a flag, or does that look like a maple leaf? We could give a lot of different prompts to get that person started to, to recognizing. And then if they, if they are interested in, in putting the puzzle pieces back together, it's, it's not that straightforward. I've had lots of people, and when I did this at the, the Halifax uh, conference, they told me it was too hard for them to put the puzzle back together again. <laughs> but but it, you know, it's, it's, maybe it won't be straightforward, but it, it's something that you can, can work at. And another way you can make the puzzle more challenging is to cut these pieces in half. So you could turn it into being from being a four-piece puzzle to a six-piece puzzle to an eight-piece puzzle if the person was motivated to, to put the puzzle pieces together. So it's just an idea of a very simple idea of a, of a way that you could be engaging some people. So, so when we put those principles back up on the screen, so really this is a backwards puzzle. And that's when I call it a reveal puzzle, we're revealing what's underneath. And, and the other thing you could do is you could have a picture of a great-grandchild or a picture of their homestead or uh, a tractor or any, it could be a picture of anything that you wanted to have. It could be from a magazine. So that's the idea is you find something that really is a good connection, a real connection for that person. Um, and so that's a, another way you can customize the activity. So if we think about it, these pieces are quite easy to grasp. Even if people, someone has a limited range of motion or, or dexterity, they should be able to be able to grab these pieces and, and maybe that's all they'll want to do is just look at these pieces and move it around in their hands and I call that a successful activity. If that's what that person wanted to do with them, I'm happy with that and I think, and I think we had some success. And when we think sequencing, there's really only one, one step to this task which is remove the piece. So we're not asking them to do a lot, we're just asking them to do that one step. I've given you some suggestions of how you can progress from simple to complex, keeping the level the same by changing the picture, cutting the pieces up, or encouraging the person to put the pieces back together again, which would be the most challenging. And re the reminder of the no quizzing as far as a procedural memory goes. 
So there really is no wrong way they could do this puzzle. The next uh, activity is the dice game. It's one of my most, my, my favorite, and I, I, I hope that there's any, any people here from long-term care that they, they gather up all the dice that they can and they put them in their scrub pockets when they go back to work, and they put those into, into use wherever they find the opportunity for a, a stolen moment with someone who's, who's not otherwise engaged and is alert. And I think the dice game is something that has some very, very broad appeal for people. So in the simplest form, you'd be putting out the numbers from one to six. You might start by demonstrating, laying out the cards from one to six, or depending on the person, they might, you start putting one to two out and they might lead the way to putting all the, the rest of the numbers out. Roll the dice and turn over or remove the number that corresponds to that dice. So it's no strategy, it's just stri strictly luck, the luck of the rolling of the dice. And because of the way you know, a lot of people play board games, they're very familiar with the, the, the uh, concept of rolling dice. And the way we build on that as well is to, when you roll two dice, when you're playing a board game, what do you do? You add the numbers together and move your piece that number. So it seems to be a pretty automatic response in people to add the number up. So if they got the one and the, and the three, they, most people want to turn the four over. So it just gives people a little bit of more choice in how they're going to play the game when you've got the two dice and the numbers from one to 12. They'll roll the dice and they won't be able to turn anything <coughs> over and that's just how the game goes. So it's, uh, it's a very straightforward, very easy, not a lot of cleanup, but a lot of general appeal. So we would start with the one to six and progress to one to 12 if the person was interested. So the way I adapted was I used a large font on those the little templates. I don't have anything else on them to distract them. There's no fancy picture. There's no watermark behind to make it fancy. It's There's no nothing to distract, distract them. And if you were doing this, if, if we had the unfortunate that there were white tablecloths or something on the table, I'd want to think to put a placemat down or something to offer some contrast because that can be a, a complicating factor that they might not be able to see. So that's. We're always trying to adapt the, the uh, environment and the activity so that the person can, can see it as well as possible. And so there are two distinct steps, rolling the dice and turning over the number. And so just working at that activity, you might find it becomes more automatic for them to, to just know what to do after they roll it. And so there's a little more strategy as far as simple to complex goes when you're using the 1 to 12 because they have the choice of adding them together or, or turning over the individuals and we're relying on procedural memory when they're rolling the dice because it is a common thing. Sometimes you need to offer the person a cup. It might be harder for them to organize doing it in their hands and holding it together. Sometimes I even use a tray to put the numbers from 1 to 6 or 1 to 12 in and let them roll the dice into the tray so that we're not chasing it under the table. So just, you know, little bits of modification that, you know, come about as, you're, as you more often do it. And really there's there's no mistake. Sometimes people find they get confused with the turning over. They turn over and turn over and turn over. So in those cases, I sometimes give them a, a bingo marker, and I just have them cover over the number the number up, and then they, they, they seem to register that, maybe because bingo is so popular, I don't know. And card sorting. You see in there you've got 13 cards. Whoever's got the cards, you've got 13 cards. There are ace to king. If you look at the backs of the cards, some are red, some are blue uh, backs. And you look at the templates, there's basically, uh, there's two different sides to the templates. One side's got um, the, the same uh, pattern as the backs of the cards. So the first part of the activity would be just simply to ask the person to, you would demonstrate to the person by matching one of the backs of the cards to the matching template, and then have the person continue on with the rest of the cards. So you could do this with a whole deck of cards, but it requires that you prepare the deck to make sure you've got some of each, each colored back. So that's why it's easier for me to demonstrate to you with a, a deck that meets all the, all the yeah. criteria. So if the person, what happens to me sometimes when I do this, because someone is so familiar with playing cards, I hand them the cards with the backs, and they turn the cards over and start sorting them into a 45 hand. I've had that happen, and at that point I just whisk my templates over and we do the red and back, black sorting because the person obviously is past the, the sorting the backs of the cards. 
Uh, another point with sorting the backs of the cards, if, if you're in long-term care, particularly it's a great activity for someone to help you by sorting the cards at the end of the day. Maybe you didn't have a card game that required two decks to be sorted together, but maybe, maybe you could have. And so you put the two decks of cards with different backs on them, and you ask someone if they can help you by sorting those decks apart and putting them back in the boxes for you so that you can be ready for the next day's activity. So it's a great little job for someone to do. A little bit of action for their hands and some, some cognitive work for them. So the, the blacks and, and reds are more complicated because you've got face cards as well as numbers. What invariably happens is they put that seven of diamonds on the seven of spades that's over on the other side, and then they're stuck. They're not sure what they should be doing. So because we don't really want to correct them, it sometimes can get a little bit tricky for exactly you know what, what way they want to progress from there. So at that point, you might wonder whether the person might uh, might be having too much challenge with this. And the next step would be, of course, sorting by suits, starting two suits, moving your way up to three suits, and gradually four suits. And to me, sorting four suits is solitaire. And then they put the cards into order after they're, they're done, and you've got a 10-minute activity that, uh, that can mean a lot to someone. So as you're familiar with these, with these concepts now, right, how we've adapted with the templates, and it's basically a one-step deal to place the card on the template that matches. We've progressed the activity, adding more challenge. Playing cards is, is relying on procedural memory right off the bat, and there really are no consequences if they, if they make a mistake. And the photo match is the last one. It's really quite simple. The, the first aspect is just looking at the cards, handing them the cards, allowing them to discuss so there's the word is printed below the cards. So they're not guessing what, what, what bird it is. And then the, the next level will be to match, the, to match the cards to the template. So again, just very, very simple how we're applying the principles that we talked about. So the keys to presenting, going back to those points, we want to encourage independence, provide choice, and prepare them for success by, by anticipating what could go wrong. We want to try to remember to always invite them to participate. Try to remember to demonstrate rather than explain what you want them to do. Offer as much praise and encouragement as you can. And end the activity by thanking them and ask them if they would like to do it again sometime. So thank you very much. <laughs>